Welcome, everyone. This is so great to see a packed crowd, and I am thrilled to be back here with Erica Christakis, who has written a very important book for those of you who haven't read it yet. Even if you're not the parent or teacher of a preschooler, I highly recommend it. And I had the great honor of speaking with Erica a few months ago um, when I was hosting the Diane Reeves right. Show, and we did a whole hour on her topic. You can also get a shorter version in the Atlantic magazine. Um, there was a wonderful article that was based on, excerpted from her book last fall. So uh, Erica Christakis says that it's likely if you walk into any preschool classroom in America, you're going to see some very familiar decor from room to room. There'll be alphabet charts, bar graphs, calendars, schedules. It is all part of what she calls a nationwide drive to make sure that kids are ready for school at a younger and younger age. And that effort, she argues in her new book, The Importance of Being Little, is misguided. She's an early childhood educator at the Yale Child Study Center. And Erica, I want to ask you, you know, when we think about what kids need, we, you know, we want to make them prepared. A lot of what this entire summit about, is about is about making kids prepared for real life. So what is wrong with this approach to making sure that there are metrics, making sure our kids learn certain things by the time they get into kindergarten? Right. Well, I would agree with you that we do need to have metrics. We need to have standards. I think all children are entitled to a year of progress every year that they're in school. Um, my question would be, what is really behind those metrics? And my perception, which I, I want to convince you and, and the audience today, is that a lot of what we think of as um, effective early learning really is rather superficial. You know, one of the ways that I describe it is that children are working harder but learning less. Um, and I think that we are cued as adults when we walk into an early childhood classroom, a preschool uh, or a kindergarten, we're sort of cued um, because of our own cultural backgrounds, our own experiences as children to respond to certain kind of cute things on the wall, um, to respond to, as you said, the number charts and the word lists, you know, that makes us feel good. We feel like there's actual learning going on. Um, and I think we have to push back a little bit and look at, well, where's the evidence? You know, what can kids do? Um, are we actually tapping their extraordinary potential intellectually and emotionally? A lot of times when we look more deeply, we find that, that there's a lot of superficial learning going on. Well, where is the evidence? You refer to evidence, and I remember a study that you talked about in Tennessee about kids who were put in specific Head Start programs that had certain kinds of learning and where they were once they got to the third grade versus other kids who had not had preschool. Tell us right. about that. The Tennessee study is a very important one because it's a randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard of scientific evidence. So there's a control group of kids who had no preschool, and then there was the experimental group that had um, the, uh, the, the publicly funded, state funded preschool. And this study came out and showed that the children who had attended the state funded preschool um, by the beginning of kindergarten actually did better on academic measures than the children who had had no preschool, which you know kind of makes sense. We would we'd expect to see that. By the end of kindergarten, the children who had attended no preschool caught up with the um, kids who had been in the state funded program. By third grade, the children actually, and, and the results were starting to seep in by first and second grade, but by third grade, it was very clear that the kids who had been enrolled in the state-funded pre-K did worse. Now, what do I mean by they did worse? They did worse academically, and they also did worse in terms of social and emotional regulation. And why? Is that because they had been forced to do such boring rote learning that they had been turned off to learning in general? They were no longer interested in the classroom? Well, you know, I think that is definitely a high Hypothesis. I think it remains to be seen. We don't know absolutely. There are probably a lot of different explanations. But the uh, authors of this of this study certainly did hypothesize that that was the reason. If you think about the fact that nowadays about 75% of four-year-olds in the United States are in some form of non-family care, so we have more and more kids who are in institutional settings. 
Um, and you know, if you look in these classrooms, there's a lot of actual boring and repetitive and often rather emotionally taxing activity. You know, there's circle time where kids sit in a circle and they look at the calendar and they ask, you know, what day are we on? And, and one study showed that after a whole year of this kind of rote um, learning, that 50% of the kids still didn't actually know what day they were on. But you know, the truth is, it's sort of a boring task, and it's developmentally mismatched, because if kids aren't learning it, and it's boring and keeping them from doing things that would be more meaningful to them, that really should get our attention. So a lot of preschool education, unfortunately, is sort of mismatched, where you know, we ask kids to do too much, but also, ironically, too Too much little. of the wrong stuff. Too much of the wrong stuff. You know, there's a mismatch developmentally. Well, there was a wonderful illustration with your Atlantic Magazine piece that showed a little child's hand coming out of a book, right. reaching for a ball, and being crushed right. by this heavy encyclopedia-like tome. Right. Are you ascent I mean, it doesn't sound like you're actually arguing that we shouldn't have preschool. It's about having the right kind of preschool. So That's right. is school antithetical to learning at the age of four? or is there some way that we can teach kids effectively at that age? I think we absolutely can teach kids effectively, and I certainly think that um, you know our, our world requires that children be in care. I mean, parents need child care, and uh, there are all kinds of great things that can come from a school setting, but we have to be careful that we don't assume that schooling and learning are the same thing, because often they are not. Uh, and when you look at the science between, but behind how children develop, uh, they learn through relationships, they learn through play. Uh, and the problem is, when we try to translate those findings into the classroom, we often run into trouble. I think one uh, mistake we make is thinking that play just sort of happens, and that um, there doesn't need to be any kind of facilitation. But if you think about it, um, actually having a play impulse, which we all have, uh, we're all hardwired to play, is not the same thing as really having play know-how. And that's where I think classrooms really sort of fall down in our mission to be developmentally appropriate. Well, OK, so what are some of the tips you would give to the teachers and the administrators in this room for encouraging teachers to encourage the right kind of play? And also, give us a little bit of the example that you use from Finland, because you yeah. use them as sort of the gold standard for yes. early childhood yes. education. And I know we're all sick of hearing about Finland and how great it is. And you know, we're not <laughs> And Finland. the Nordic <laughs> Summit was just here. We heard right. more no, about it. No, I them. get it. We're not <laughs> Finland. But we can learn from it. I think what's really interesting about countries like Finland and there are other models as well in the United States. I mean, everything from Montessori to um, Reggio Emilia to you know schools in Italy. I mean, there are all kinds of great models, tools of the mind. You know, they have a kind of intentional approach where they really are respecting kids' intelligence. And um, I talk about the the child size habitat. You know, I think the good programs really are responding to children's uh, needs and not trying to impose a sort of adult view of what it's like to be a kid. So, what does that look like in a classroom, um, one of the first things that it look, one of the first things that you see is um, in intentional child-sized environments, kids actually have time. You know, they have time to learn. They're not being whisked away from one activity to the next. Um, they have time to engage. You know, a lot of times kids seem bored, and the temptation is, and I say this as a parent and as a, a former preschool teacher, you know, the temptation is to try to whisk things away and sort of present something new because we assume that kids have short attention. Span. But sometimes a kid being allowed to just sit on the floor and stare at the ceiling, you say is actually okay and educational, even though our impulses would be this right. child is bored, they're actually, there's learning going on, even because in that case. That's exactly right, because children are hardwired to learn, they're hardwired to ask questions, to be engaged. And so if we give them the time and space, I think a lot of times our anxiety keeps us from allowing children to activate their own internal learning impulses, you know, because we're so worried about, um, you know, we want the visuals, we want the metrics that are right. so obvious, and it's hard to know sometimes what's really going on inside. And for those people in the audience who might not know about the Finnish model, what you are referring to is how in Finland they don't actually teach children to read until they're ready, and sometimes that might be age seven, That's correct? Right. That's right. Now, people assume that children aren't learning to read, and the interesting thing, of course, is that many of them do read, because when you create an environment, a learning environment that is rich and responsive and 
play-based and relationship-based, you know, many kids actually do develop the kinds of pre-literacy skills that they need. So, um, you know, there isn't a trade-off, and I think that's the thing that I want people to understand. You know, even the title of this session is sort of interesting, uh, because it's, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the, the case for letting kids be kids. And, you know, I, I wonder, I'd like to ask, I mean, you probably assumed that I was brought in to kind of reassure you that, you know, kids need um, time to be kids, and, you know, I'm sort of the counterpoint to what everyone else is saying today. Um, but that's not true. What I'm trying to say is that the play-based, relationship-based, exploratory, active learning-based model is really the one that will get the results we want. All right, well, terrific. Let's go to some questions in the audience. There might be people wanting to know how to apply this at their own schools. Yes, and if you please identify yourself. You actually already, is, it, is this going? Oh, you actually already took my question. Um, my name is Teresa Loth. I, you mentioned how sometimes students miss out on opportunities to learn because teachers are too scared to relinquish that control. So I wonder what suggestions you have to help teachers let go and let kids right. Great, great question. And integrate into that your total diss on the turkey craft, <laughs> which broke my heart because I, I love those little turkey crafts, how the many hand craft you, that How many home. of you have made the Thanksgiving hand? <laughs> right, everybody. I love it. I and know. all the parents have them at home on right. the fridge. So what my challenge to you is, why do we do this? Why do we keep, why? I mean, why do we keep having kids trace their hand? You know. How is this connected to, um, to anything, really? Uh, <laughs> to, um, but to get to your point, because as a former teacher myself, it's, it, you know, I don't mean to uh, make fun of teachers at all or to disparage parents who want um, refrigerator art. You know, I've been that parent, I've been that teacher. Uh, but we really have to look more carefully at what kind of learning is going on in some of these sort of cutesy crafts and rote learning versus the kind of deep experience-based learning that happens when we give kids time. So to answer the question, um, I think the first thing we need to do is, is loosen up the schedule. You know, we need to really look, uh, and you need to work with your, uh, you know, your director, your principal, with your colleagues, and really do a sort of study, a time use study of, you know, what is gained and what is lost from these transitions and, and this sort of frenetic pacing. Um, that's something that I think you have to do at sort of a school level, and that requires communication with families, because a lot of times parents really want um, the, the bells and whistles, you know, they want their children to be taken out of class to go to music because it feels like, you know, I'm paying all this money, you know, I want all these extras. And so we as educators need to help parents understand that there's a cost to some of um, the scheduling. So I think that's one thing. And one other thing I would add um, is just, I mean, there's so many things uh, uh, that we could that, I mean, I guess I would make a little pitch for my book because <laughs> there are some tips in there. But um, I think observing children is incredibly helpful. And that, again, requires a school system that gives teachers the time to be um, intentional learners as teachers, where they really have the time to reflect on what they're seeing in children. Because when you observe children carefully, um, they, they tell you what, what they need. All right, Erica Christakis, the author of The Importance of Being Little, thank you so much. Thank you.